so good morning again, everybody. My name is Jesse, and welcome to part two of our epic seven-part series today for March Mammal Madness. This is the first ever March Mammal Madness festival in conjunction with us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are absolutely thrilled today to have a bevy of some of the coolest scientists on this planet talking about their work, talking about their enthusiasm for wildlife, and getting you guys all jazzed up for the epic tournament to come all March long. For those who are new to what we do, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We usually do about 40 programs monthly, so seven in one day is even a little much for us, but that is just a, the essence of this exciting festival. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you caught our first program at eight in the morning, we talked about a retrospective of the whole 10 year anniversary of this epic program of the Epic March Mammal Madness. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel that's gonna live there forever. Or the rest of the day, we've got genetics, we've got art and design, we've got more animal behavior, but today, Right now, at 9 Eastern, we are going to dive in with animal behavior, ethology, my favorite topic, the thing that got me interested in science as a boy, and I'm so excited to be joined by four scientists from California, Colorado, Pennsylvania, groups uh, uh, joining us on YouTube from all across the continent, so welcome into all our epic classrooms. And so what I wanted to do with a bunch of animal behavior folks is start off with cool animal behavior stories. And so Patrice Connors is joining us. I'm going to start with you. What is a, an, a cool story for our audience today? Is there something that jumps out that you've had the chance to experience that like would blow people's minds to get them excited about wildlife before this tournament? Oh my gosh. Um, so it's, hello everyone. I'm so excited you're here. I'm so excited to chat with you guys today um, as well as everyone else on this panel. So um, in terms of the animal research that I do, I work with small rodents known as wood rats or pack rats. Um, so they're nocturnal. They're usually out at night, not during the day. So I don't get to see them too much during the day. But um, one cool, well, I would say more one funny and unique experience. And here they are. They're so, I think they're particularly cute. They're kind of a cross between a rat and a mouse, um, but way cuter. They make these really obvious kind of disorganized nests at the base of trees where I do my research in southern Utah and western Colorado. And um, one story that doesn't so much have to do with my wood rats, but my field sites. I work on a lot of uh, public land and federal land here in the United States, which is awesome that we have that space. Uh, but that means there's other animals there. And uh, one of my first field trips out to investigate these animals, um, the other animals that were there were a herd of cows and they kind of kept me up all night. It turns out cows can be kind of noisy. So you never quite know where um, you're gonna find these animals and what other animals are gonna be there. Fantastic. Patrice, a couple notes. By the way, the fact that you chose to emphasize the disordered nature of their nest is amazing. So thank you for that. And behind you, you have two of the best book, science books of all time. I'm going to like, if we could zoom in, we would. But you've got oh, Women yeah. in Science, which is an amazing story. So again, at Exploring by the Senior Fans, all month long, we kick out all the men and spend the entire month only celebrating amazing women in science and exploration. That is the best book I've ever read on it. So thank you for having that. And also Crap Taxidermy, which is amazing <laughs> from a, a weird animal perspective. I appreciate you very, very much. Now, Asia, Asia Murphy is joining us in UC Santa Cruz, which is the place we all wish we were. I'm in the middle of a blizzard in Ontario. I think I'm the lone Canadian today, which makes me feel very superior, uh, frankly. Uh, but we're going to head to Asia to tell us a little bit about what she does and uh, uh, a cool fieldwork story. Asia, take us away. Yeah. Um, so my name is Asia Murphy. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University of Santa Cruz. And what I do is I put out cameras in the forest and basically just get pictures of animals and figure out about their lives, what they're doing, um, how they're active and how they're interacting with each other through pictures. Um, so uh, I just try to figure out a really good um, animal behavior story. And I think I have a good one. So I used to work in Madagascar for my master's project, and I didn't know this before I came there, but um, Madagascar has a bunch of lemur species, which are only found in Madagascar, and one of the largest ones is the Indri. And this animal actually um, will sing like a whale. Um, and I didn't realize this. I mean, I'd heard a little bit of it while I was doing my field work, uh, which went from September to January. And, you know, I heard a couple of the songs, but it was usually during the day. But as the spring and entered summer, which is in Madagascar, it's January. So that's summer. Um, as spring entered summer, the songs would become earlier and earlier until like I'd be waking up at four in the morning and hearing 
injury songs um, going off. So I'm gonna see if I can share this. Oh, I so hope you can. Injury songs are one of the great joys of the entire well, I, I have a video file, but I'm just gonna share a, a picture real quick. Okay. So you guys actually see what an injury is. I'll get their name up on the screen in a banner as well. I they are just such I, I, I've been to Madagascar and uh, just a couple hours east of the capital, you get the chance to hear them. They're just the most amazing, amazing creature. You're gonna have to come back to me because I can't figure it out. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, we'll come back. Let's just have the fun of video broadcast. Something has to go a little awry. So actually, before we we leave you, you talked about filming animals. What what do you film? Like what what are you trying to capture? Um, we're basically just trying to figure out where they're living, um, what kind of habitats they like, and when they're active. And through that information, we can figure out how different species are interacting with each other. So, for example, nowadays I'm looking at how coyotes, um, which have become sort of the apex predator in a lot of urban carnivore communities, are influencing how skunks, opossums, raccoons, where they're active and when they're active. Fascinating. I uh, grew up in Toronto, and so we have coyotes in like all the parks and on my main street, and they're beautiful canids. Again, uh, we talked about animal interactions to begin the day in our first broadcast, so if you guys are filling out your bracket, consider those sort of things. Consider that ecology, because it really does go in in a big way into choosing which creature might win each specific battle in the tournament. Now, let's head to Ann Hilborn, who had a fantastic, fun test call with me yesterday about her amazing work. Ann, tell us a little bit more about what you do and uh, a cool story you might have to share with us. Hi everybody, so I'm Anna Hilborn and um, I worked for many years on cheetahs in Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And uh, for my PhD research, what I did is uh, follow, tried to follow the same cheetah for up to five days in order to record how many hunts they did, what they hunted, um, how much they ate um, and any interactions with their prey and with other carnivores. Um, and so, once I was able to follow this, this young mother named Asti who had five tiny little fluffball cubs. And I followed her for about three days. And on the last day in the very early morning, so there was beautiful, beautiful dawn light happening. She was crouched down with her cubs and this hyena approached. And cheetahs are big animals, but in Serengeti, they are not the biggest carnivore out there. And so hyenas are actually a bigger carnivore that can sometimes kill their cubs. Um, they also sometimes chase them off kills and steal their food. But when I saw this, I was really worried that I was about to see sort of like cubs being killed, which as a researcher, as a person, you really want to sort of try to stop that. But as a researcher and an animal behaviorist, you can't, you have to sort of stay back and work, sort of watch what's happening and not interfere. Um, and so I'd never seen this sort of interaction before, but what happened is Asti sort of crouched down and then the hyena wasn't particularly aggressive. It was just kind of walking by, but Asti crouched down and then she sort of stalked towards the hyena. She left her cubs where they were and stalked towards the hyena and then ended up doing this kind of fake bluff charge towards it. And the hyena just sort of <laughs> looked at her and decided, you know, it's not worth this kind of aggravation in the morning, kind of kept on walking. Um, and so Asti sort of saved her cubs, which, and it was just such a cool interaction between a mother and cubs and another carnivore that could potentially have been super aggressive and dangerous, but ended up not being, um, which is a cool thing about March Mantle Madness is many of our battles actually don't end in carnage or uh, death. There's a lot of interactions between animals that, you know, just sort of, they notice each other and then they kind of go on their way. They don't necessarily fight all the time. I shared the bracket earlier today, so maybe the embarrassment of pandas in the town of prairie dogs in our mammal collectives, the pandas aren't necessarily eating the prairie dogs at the end, because they're bamboo eaters, so they probably, eh, not their favorite thing, but they might scare them off, or I really think that that's one of my, my epic um, upsets that I'm planning for in the bracket, and again, for those uh, folks who are new to this, you guys can check out the bracket on the lip guide. I'm going to make sure that's up on the screen for everybody right now. And I'll put it in the YouTube chat for everybody as well. So if you want to see this bracket, see how some of these battles might unfold. Chia, hyena, now we know what happens. Like you have a living experience of what a battle could be. Unfortunately, that is not an option this year, folks. So we'll, we'll have to let that go until maybe March Middle Madness number 11. But thank you, Anne, for the, the great tale. Um, all right, last but not least, 
Anna Dasari, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, you get to specialize in something a little bit different than the rest of our science today. But do tell us what exactly that is and, and what you get the chance to do. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Mona, and I recently started a postdoctoral researcher position at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, sorry, my own mammal here just jumped up on the table the second we started talking, obviously. Um, but I'm most interested in um, how animals interact with each other and their environments. And in particular, my work focuses on how an animal's behavior and environment change the bacteria that live in their guts or their gut microbiome. So here I have a picture of a baboon. That's probably the best, most uh, useful picture I'll ever take where he's just kind of standing over this poop sample. We'll collect the poop sample if we know who actually left it. Um, we'll extract all the DNA from it and then do a bunch of statistical analyses. So that's what I'm showing on this slide. Um, my PhD work, as you might be able to tell, focused on how troops of baboons live, um, live in Kenya and um, interact with each other in their environments. Um, and I know, especially in the tournament, um, baboons are, think are thought of as pests or mean monkeys, um, but seeing them in the wild, um, I, I can't actually disagree with that. They act a lot like the movie Mean Girls um, and they have their own little alliances and grudges with one another. It's really a sight to behold. <laughs> so Mona, so by the way, when you're saying that the baboons are, are you know, the, they mess things up for everybody else, Anne's like nodding, Patrice, everyone's nodding yeah. in the background for yep. me. So <laughs> like, sure, we're, we're gonna bring you all on screen for this for a second. Um, <laughs> like, is there a creature that is like the, the nemesis of your specific animal like whenever you've been in the field in various things whether it's you know us madagascar or wherever and what what's like what message with it? is it hyenas is it ever lions. Lions. lions lions are the worst they are the worst they're, they're, <laughs> they're, 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 they're the number one seed and you know what i'm hoping personally that the labor of moles take them out they just dig under the lion the lion falls in the pit it could happen. I that would be that. very satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Anne's taking a clear side. Unlike our first, uh, our, our first group today, they were kind of equivocating. They weren't sure about their bracket. You guys were like, okay, moles over lions. Uh, Asia, what like, what messes with your creatures? Who's the worst? So if we're gonna keep on with the injury, um, the worst is the fusa actually, which was the carnivore I really wanted to study while I was in Madagascar. Um, so they'll make this little honking noise whenever they see them prowling below. Um, yeah, those are the worst. Okay, so uh, Patrice, I'm coming to you in just a second. Fusa, there's the name below. It's like a turbo weasel that hunts lemurs. I literally talked to my fiance about this the other day, and she's like, wait, something hunts lemurs? I'm like, yeah, she's like, that ruined my whole childhood. Like, Zabumafu was something that I thought was, like, totally fine. He's just prancing along. He's bouncing along the forest. Everybody's happy. The crap brothers are all, it's all very sweet. And then here comes this giant thing that, like, leaps after them. Like, if you're a lemur and you leap 40 feet between trees, you're like, I'm good. Nothing can catch me. I grab the spikes, but no. Scary. Everyone, okay, if I can pull up a, a Fusa picture by the end of this, I'm going to. Um, Patrice, what, what messes with your thing? Asia, did you have a comment on Fusa? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I have a picture. I just got to find it. Find it. And I, I have powers too. I can. I brought up, listen, I brought up Anne's pictures. Anne tried to show Cheetah pictures and we got them a little bigger today. So like, just say the word. I've got an injury call actually I'm going to play in a minute. Um, but Patrice, what, what messes with your creature? Man, with the pack rats, like everything, they're kind of low on the food chain. They're kind of mm -hmm. like the snack bars of the desert, you know, which is great. They're important. They're needed. They are our primary consumers. So the cool thing about pack rats, which has to do with my research, is they actually eat plants. Um, a lot of a lot of times, a lot of rodents will eat a little bit of everything, some insects, some seeds. These guys can actually specialize on plants and they can actually eat particularly toxic plants, which is why I find them so cool and interesting. Um, but yeah, in terms of my population that lives in Southern Utah, it's the coyotes. We got some ring-tailed cats down there. There are birds of prey at night since these guys are nocturnal. So normally these guys live only about two or three years. I mean, the rodents, they live short and fast. That's kind of their MO. But um, yeah, I would say a lot of things are out to get them. That said, they are definitely some of the largest rodents in my community. So I also have really cute pinion mice, which basically look like mice that have huge Dumbo ears. Um, I've got kangaroo mice that are the cutest. They don't have any sort of nose. They're, they're not, their rostrum just kind of breaks down, like falls off very quickly versus the traditional rat. Um, and then they hop like a kangaroo, which is why they have the name uh, kangaroo mice. <laughs> 
So there's a lot of, it's a very rich community in terms of other rodents that live out there, which is cool. Um, wood rats are definitely the biggest ones. They're probably, you know, um, they would fit in two hands, right? That's kind of a good scale. They're anywhere from 150 to maybe upward of 300 grams, um, which is really hard for me to put in ounces because they're mostly hair. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So there, so everything kind of picks on them, which is unfortunate, but they're, they're doing well. Their populations are doing well. They're a healthy population. They're not endangered by any means, which also makes them kind of easy to study. It's amazing that everyone gets to study these really cool animals, but I'm sure these other ladies can tell you, you kind of got to fill out some paperwork and tell everyone what you're doing to make sure you're doing it correctly. And for me, I'm kind of like, I'm just studying some rats. And they're like, okay, go for it. Um, so it's, it, it's fun to see the different animals that everyone works with. So you told this beautiful, cute story at the end there, but you started with snack bars of the desert, which I think is going to be the title of our broadcast by the end. It's Mother's Day Madness, 9 a.m. right now, and that's just really boring. So we're going to come up with like a fun thing. Um, by the way, okay, in our first broadcast in Asia, I'm going to bring up the food in a second because I'm very excited about this. So in our first broadcast, we debated niche versus niche was our like go-to like thing. I'm team niche, and frankly, I don't want to hear from you because that's the right answer. Um, but for you said coyotes. So coyotes, coyotes, who's team, okay, who's team coyotes? So yeah. I grew up, as, I grew up as team coyote, but now that I'm out West, it's what? definitely coyote. So I, I will, depending where I am, I will morph to okay. what everyone prefers. Well, so that's anyone me. on the, the YouTube chat, if you guys want to chime in too, and, and how are you going to do that? Just do it phonetically. Yeah. On YouTube and we'll know. Uh, Asia, let's check out this uh, awesome video. Yeah, ooh, that's exciting. Okay, I'm excited. And then I'm gonna play the injury after this. Look at this thing. It just, it means business. This would have won the tournament. I don't think we have this this year, no. But like, no one would top this thing. But it, he looks sinister. He's like a leopard seal, right? You see <laughs> yeah. a leopard seal and you're like, that thing means business. I don't want to mess with that thing. We had uh, uh, Melissa on earlier talking about Gila monsters. It's like, if you come across a Gila monster in the desert, you're like, I'm not gonna touch that. Like, no, why would I? And who said they're, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna play this injury. So sorry, we've gone completely off the rails here, but uh, like injury got brought up, and I'm biased, and I have too much power in this broadcast. So I'm gonna play this for people, so you can hear this because truly, there's very few sounds in the world that are better than an injury call. So let's bring that up for everybody and do it. All right. <laughs> Oh, so much fun. See, this is like what we're all like, just talking about the March Mammal Madness Room. We're just screaming from the trees to everybody. And that's how we ended up with, I think, what was the final tally or like the early tally is like 480,000 kids or something have signed up for this program, which is like the population of Atlanta, where they probably still say coyote, by the way. Um, just because you're in the South doesn't mean you need to switch it up. Uh, okay, we've got, let's see, uh, a whole bunch of comments coming in YouTube. I want to see if we get some questions from our audience today. We've got crayfish versus crawfish. We've got people that are debating this now. See, I've, I've taken us down the rabbit hole. So while we're waiting for a few questions, oh, how to go in? For this year's bracket, I'm really curious. For people that might be new to this, we have a lot of audience from the March Mammal Madness community. We have a lot of audience from the Exploring by the City of Your Pants community. If you're new to this, have you filled out brackets before? Do you have a favorite this year? Why? Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, Mona, you're at the top of my screen, so I'm going to start with you first. Uh, take us away. Um... I, I've been really busy with my new job. So I'm like putting off, like creating my bracket till this weekend. So I'm really excited to look through it and like play with all the animals um, or think through how I might write those battles and how I might like basically my favorites through that and throughout it. Um, I know the romp of otters, I think is going to go far as you might've noticed my little otter mug here. Yes. That might oh. be my go-to despite the lioness and the orca. And, you know, you just have to go with your heart on some level. I must say the amount of nerdy science paraphernalia that's been behind all the people so far. We got like, like, like test tubey things. We got like animal pictures in everyone's places. We got mugs now. Like you guys really like live and breathe this stuff. If you came in, like Mark had these epic fossils earlier, like a giant like hominid skull in his desk, but why not? So... Okay, and what's your take? Is there like a, a are you team lichen this year, or do you think the common prawn is going to beat out the orca? What are we What are we thinking? 
Um, I like to go about it sort of the opposite way and deciding who I want to make lose. Um, and that <laughs> is the Lions. <laughs> I'm hoping they don't win. Um, and I recently read a paper about some extremely gory behavior by orcas. And so I'm trying to decide if that makes me want them to win or not. Um, Orcas are very, very impressive. But the thing about Marshmallow Madness is they might suddenly get stuck in a terrestrial <laughs> environment at some point. Um, or they might not do so well. So, mm. yeah, it's kind of tough to call some of these battles because there's such this wild card element about habitat because a lot of animals are really specifically adapted to a very specific habitat and you've taken out of it. Uh, they don't do so well. So we'll see. Two things. One, I love that you have the darkest side of anyone who's joined us so far with that. So thank you for that glorious uh, speech. Uh, and yes, we talked about this earlier. Like, again, this is not an actual battle this year, but it's the polar bear versus lion. And the lion has to go up to the Arctic or the polar bear has to come down to the Serengeti. That's a really big shift. And so for people filling out their brackets for the first time, make sure you're noting this. Like, the if the orca ends up on land, that's not going to be a good place for him, even though he's got truly the most terrifying skull in the history of the animal kingdom. So like nothing beats the orca. You can check, no, no, the dinosaurs, like Pluridon, I don't care about any of these things. Orcas are the most metal skull ever, ever. Okay, Asia, um, what is what is your thoughts for this? And by the way, actually, do you want me to bring up your video first? Because you got a second video. You're just like, the, now you're the video master is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I just have to find them. I have a whole bunch of videos. Um, yeah, so uh, we were talking about, I was talking about earlier um, about how FUSA will hunt injury and injury have this warning call. So the second video is the warning call. Um, and I was actually trying to figure out where they were in the forest by the warning call. I was trying to get pictures of them. So um, it sounds like a goose, actually, which is weird. Ooh, okay, you, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited. Here we go. It is a goose. That's a goose. That's not an injury. You're lying. Are you sure? Yeah, so you, you're just walking through the Madagascar rainforest and you suddenly hear like this barnyard goose go on. You're just like, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, oh, so which one I would pick? Um, I just had to look at the bracket. And honestly, I was really, really, really disappointed that there weren't leopard seals because I love them. Um, but... I have to go with Sneak of Weasels, and that's because weasels are just B-A-M-Fs. They're so bad. They're just so vicious for their size, and just a bunch of weasels all at once, they, they got to win. They got to go. So up here in the Great White North, I know you have them in the U.S. too. I think we have more of them, even though no one ever finds them. We have wolverines, and it's like they take down like caribou. She this like weasel. It's a big weasel. Don't get me wrong. He's like he's like a he's like a mid-sized, smallish dog. But like you're a deer, and you're like four hundred pounds or three hundred pounds. You're like scrolling along, and you see this thing, and you're like, oh. and then it like takes you down. The like it's the shock on their face as the wolverine is savaging their neck. That just would be like, oh, I never saw this coming. It's so unexpected. Fusha too. Like so, let's think about this. What we got? We got weasels. We got mink and stoats. So you're a porcupine, right? And you're you're throwing along, you got all these spikes, and then a fisher comes and just flips you over and eats you. Like it's it's terrifying. They're the, they're the worst. Um, anyway, the worst yeah. are the best, Jesse. The worst are the best. Depends how you look at it. That's yeah. true. I mean, <laughs> that's the essence of this whole tournament. It depends what you like. And honestly, in the chat, so many great people talking about the things that they love. I, I love some of these comments, guys. Thank you so much, Patrice. Okay, you're last but not least in this question, and then we'll we'll take, start taking some questions from our YouTube friends. But what do you? What, what's your take this year? So I actually just filled out my bracket yesterday. Ooh. So full, full disclosure, I started as like a total fangirl of this competition. Um, Katie came to the University of Utah where I was at the time, gave a talk, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's the March Mammal Madness lady. And like, I totally fangirled out on her. And then later, sent her an email being like, hey, you know, if you ever need help with this, I'd be happy to. And like, there must have been a tremor in the force because then either the day before or the day after I sent that email, she like sent out a broadcast asking more people to help. So, so that all said, before I even get into the weeds of like, you know, trying to figure out how to narrate these battles, I as the fan go in and fill out my bracket. I will also say out of, I think the five, probably six years I've been doing this, my husband who's a civil engineer and likes rocks, has beat me almost every time. Last year, I beat him. 
So it is a little bit of component of um, pride for me at home to make sure that I try to do well as the mammologist. Um, but this year, so this year I decided the winner is going to be the American bison because they are freaking huge. Yeah. I, when I was at the University of Utah, we have an amazing state park called Antelope Island where we manage a bison herd. And I've been lucky enough to bring my mammalogy students out there. And these animals, not only are they huge, um, but they can jump their height. So they what? have, exactly, no. exactly. No, they can't. I've seen, no it. I've seen it. I don't have a video, but I've seen it. Because once a year, what they do is they, since it's a managed herd, they bring every in, everyone in, do health checks. Um, and then actually there's other managed herds in the United States now. So they kind of swap around males and females to make sure all the genetics are great, which is good for conservation. <laughs> and um, these, and they literally had to, they had a wood, corral that they built that was like eight feet tall but the bison broke it and jumped over it so then they had to build a metal one that was like 12 feet tall and while i was there a bison jumped so high i saw its little eyeball come up over so these animals if they want to be can be pretty dang intense so it was kind of hard but once i got down to my final floor and the bison was still there i was like oh man they're going to, I mean, unless they're in the ocean, which as Anne said, is an important thing to consider. And that I really toyed with for a while. I was like, nope, going to be the bison. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter. They just swim right under the orca. Mm, get them. Okay. So in my mind, I don't know if anyone else thought this too, but like jump their height. I pictured straight up as opposed to sort of like a, an arc, which is much more terrifying. I don't know. I, that, that would really freak me out. By the, you four are amazing, by the way. This is incredible. Okay. Um, by the way, okay, we're going to head to YouTube in a minute. This has been so much fun. The comments uh, are, are fantastic. By the way, we've got a teacher uh, who we work with uh, a lot, Henry Spira. And you're like, you have a fangirl already, which is amazing. So this is like the essence of March Middle Madness. If people are joining for the first time and you like love our four scientists today, if you love any of the scientists in our seven hours of ridiculous broadcasting, uh, you know, get involved. Get, find out more about them. This is the thing. Scientists love to nerd out about their work. It's not just in this festival. If you email scientists, most of them, 96% don't bite, right? Which is really a good odd considering we have some mammologists today. Even mammologists that lose to their civil engineer partners in, in mammal broadcast. No, I mean, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> I was saying in our first session, we had a, a football pool in my, in my high school and like the teacher that always picked all the underdogs won every single year. So that could be your strategy. And if you pick all the number one seeds, I don't know, it seems kind of... It's not, I, it's not cool. I don't know. We're not sure. Um, okay. YouTube. So many. Oh, by the way, uh, Katie, thank you for this, Katie, um, who's watching. Whenever she's not in, she's watching, which is a, a good lesson for the day. No, no, we'll all be <laughs> together. My pick, which I think beats the bison, I got to say, is Team Sentient Pineco. Pangolins all the way. So the bison comes and the pangolin just sticks his tongue right up the nose. And then the bison <laughs> runs away. Because he's really, <laughs> he jumps away, maybe he hops. Is my thought if it gets down to those two, just say. Okay. Um, YouTube. By the way, Anand, you are like the, you have the best uh, things ever. We have uh, comments like "all oh, just a weaponized sausage," very cute, which I've lost the context for at this point, but it's just a glorious thing to bring up on a screen. We've got people in biodiversity labs. We've got a Miss Fields class who talks about pronunciations all the time in classes. So coyote, coyote. I'm so glad we're getting on that. Let's see what we have. Oh, this Jurchit wants to know, what's the hardest part about studying mammoths? Like, is it all peaches and cream? Um, we're going to start in reverse order this time because I can. Uh, Patrice, what's the hardest part? Is it is it the March Mammal Madness losing? Is it the, what's the word? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, for me, I think the, the hardest part um, in terms of my job right now is finding the time. So I work at a university, Colorado Mesa University in Grand Junction, Colorado, Loop Loop, Western Slope. And um, our university is very teaching focused. So any given semester, I teach four to six different classes. So during the academic school year, you know, uh, August to May, right? <laughs> um, I teach, that's what I do. So I really don't have time to go out and study my wood rats or even go out and collect data to then bring back and maybe do some analyses on the computer or in the lab um, until the summer or even my winter breaks. So for me, and that's the choice in my career in terms of what I chose. I knew I wanted to be at a university. I really enjoyed that environment. Um, I really love the job I have now. I really like teaching. And in fact, I'm 
gave March Mammal Madness to my own college students this semester, my nice. animal biology class to complete. But for me, the hardest thing is, even though my wood rats here are literally in my backyard, I only have to drive 40 minutes to find them. It's just finding the time to make sure that I can um, put the time in. I want to do it well, right? I don't want to do you know, a C plus job in terms of my research. I want to make sure what I'm doing, like I'm collecting the data that I need. I want to make sure I'm not bothering them and like harassing, not harassing them, but you know, like working with them in a way that makes everyone feel better. So for me, it's in terms of my job right now, it's finding the time. So it was a beautiful answer. And I want to harp on two things because I know we've got a lot of high school students today that might be thinking about going to university. They might be wanting to get involved. They might be inspired by you scientists. So two notes that you made there. One is that you study animals right in your own backyard. Now, one of the cool things about being a scientist is that you do get to collaborate with people around the world. And in many cases, especially in field biology, you get the chance to go to places in the world. You can pick, if you want to study kangaroos, you can head to Australia and do that as part of your work, which is really cool. But no matter where you are on this planet, there is so much to discover. And I think that's one of the big lessons of, of Marshmallow Madness, the big lessons of, of all the science outreach initiatives that we try and do as individuals and as a collective, is that the world is exciting and there's so much to to revel in in nature. And I'm so, yeah. I'm so glad and you mentioned that. Jesse, before you hit your second point, I just put up another slide. So I've been lucky enough to go to different nations to do some of my research, even though I work with animals in my backyard right now. So I've had the opportunity during school to go to Australia twice, once to study little betongs, which are like kangaroo rats on steroids. They still hop around and we were following them. Um, and the picture on the lower left is one jumping into our bait bucket while we were trying to set traps for them. Um, and then I went a second time to work with brush tail possums, which are really similar to raccoons in terms of their size and the behavior and where you find them. Um, and then I also had an opportunity to go to Greece to study spiny mice, which is like if a mouse and a hedgehog had a baby, they basically have these modified hairs for defense purposes. So you do like, even though I've kind of been on this single track of like being in academia and in school for kind of a long time, I've had really cool opportunities to do research around the world. And I will say being part of March Mammal Madness has connected me with so many other amazing scientists, like the women who are here, who've gotten to do amazing research around the world. And it's just so cool to hear about what they do and hear about their experiences as well. So I just wanted to mention that since that was a nice segue. You know, Patrice. I, and you mentioned something else in that. Sorry, there's like segues galore. We can talk all day. <laughs> uh, I have time to talk all day for everything. Um, I, Asia, I am coming to you next, I promise. Um, so you mentioned teaching universities. So this is really important for students. Like when, when I was a student when I was in high school, the whole emphasis was what's the best university? When universities are typically ranked, it's based on research. And research is great. If you want a fantastic student experience, look for universities that have teaching uh, as a big part of what they do, because you will get to interact with the best people. You'll get to learn from the best people, which I frankly think is one of the most enriching experiences you can have. And I can tell you from colleagues of mine or friends of mine that went to other universities that were more emphasizing teaching, they enjoyed that quite a bit more. So just depending on what you're interested in, in your career, in your life, if you go into science, uh, that's something really, really worth noting. And you mentioned how much schooling it takes. And so, I mean, this could be a whole other broadcast, but like the prospect, if you're in grade 10, of, oh, I finished grade 12, and then I get a bachelor's degree, and then I get a master's degree, and we've got a lot of doctors in today's tournament, and you get like four or five more years, and you're like, whoa, that's way too much school. But at the end of that, you're young. You have the opportunity to work with amazing people around the world. You get to be fulfilled in everything that you do. You get paid pretty well, which is great too. So for our high schoolers thinking about that, and th there's just so many perks to going into this. It's not for everybody. High level academia is not something that is for the faint of heart. Uh, it takes a lot out of you, but it's something that can really lead to fantastic, inspiring careers where you end up as completely jazzed as the four amazing scientists we have today joining us. Uh, Asia, what is, uh, I, I don't, man, I've almost forgot my question. I, I'm too hyped up. There's too much coffee in me is the problem. Asia, but do tell, maybe you remember what I said. <laughs> no, I was too busy looking up spiny mice. I didn't know that there were such things. And then I was in their the images that I was, they're very cute. I love them. I think the question was, um, what was challenging about studying? Yes, thank you, Patrice. Someone's paying attention. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, who, um, there's a couple, yeah. It, Studying mammals is very challenging. There's a lot of reasons why it's challenging. I guess personally for me, the one thing I do not always like is um, the fact that you have to hike a lot. Um, 
And, you know, I, I don't mind being outside. I love being outside, actually. But when I'm talking about hiking, I'm talking about hiking up really steep terrain um, when it's muddy and you're always slipping down and um, it might be raining at the same time and your feet might be blistered from the day before and you might be trying to push through a whole bunch of rhododendron and you're getting smacked back or there might be ticks or leeches. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, all the all those little parasites that you pick up, they're just it's not fun for me personally. So it, are parasites fun for anyone? Put up your hand if you love ticks. Who loves ticks? No, no one loves ticks. So that's a really good point, actually. And it's funny, one of the questions we got on YouTube was like, how do you track the injury? And that's the answer. You're like, you're you're not just walk. I actually, to be fair, in some of my animal experiences, I was literally like in the parking lot of a national park when lemurs were above my head, which is great if that happens to you. So nice. But a lot of it is pretty intense stuff. And you've you got to go searching with these things. You mentioned leeches. I was reading a David Attenborough book the other day. They stopped in the Indo-Malayan forest. And if you stop, you hear the leeches coming through the forest at you, which is just the worst. Yeah, you could see them crawling up your boots. And that's why you wear like light colored uh, field pants so that you can stop them before they get to any flesh. Um, yeah, it's it's a whole thing. Um, so Asia Patrice, you guys gave great answers. That's what I want to do actually. We've got so many questions coming in on YouTube. We've got about 10 more minutes. So I want to take a few different questions and we'll start with Mona and Anne to go with those and we'll see if we can take uh, as many as we possibly can. So Ms. Dixon wants to know, I love this, and Mona, you can start with this. As professors and research scientists, what characteristics are most important when considering student candidates to involve in your research? So if you're bringing in people as excited as you, or hopefully as excited as you, what are you thinking about? Now, Mona, you're a PhD student, so what was your experience with this? And uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest thing when interviewing like undergrads who want to get involved with our research currently is just curiosity, curiosity and excitement about whatever um, is going to happen. Because like right now I'm planning more experiments, whereas in my PhD, it was all like observational and um, work that or samples that had already been collected. But now we're actually like collecting and running these experiments ourselves. So we have to be kind of ready for anything to happen in that context. We have to be ready for uh, leeches potentially because now we're going to be sampling ponds and things um, for all of these different frogs that we're going to be collecting. So we just have to be ready for anything to happen, but like you just kind of have to like keep that energy level. So that's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love the passion answer. This is something that we get, in, I, I'm sure we're going to get all day long in the Smart Channel Madness Festival, but in all of our broadcasts, what sparks a lot of people is just this love for what they do, this love for a creature, this love for a topic. And I mean, you, you four are nodding your head, but you embody that so beautifully in the story that we told today. And, and again, I'm really excited to see how this plays out over the whole uh, festival. And I've got a different question for you because I can. Uh, Ms. Dix Class, they want to know, what inspired everyone to study animal behaviors? And by everyone, we mean specifically you in this context. Um, I, it's just something that I find really interesting. Like I, ever since I was a kid, I liked watching animals and seeing what they do. Um, and it took me a while to realize that not everybody is really into that. Like sometimes when I go hiking with my dad, I did recently in the California desert and we saw a coyote. And what I wanted to do was stop and watch the coyote as much as possible. And my dad sort of looked at it for, you know, 10 seconds and then was ready to keep hiking. Um, and so the thing, I just love watching animals and sort of trying to figure out why they do what they do and what they're doing. It's, it's not always super fun. Like, especially cats spend a lot of time sleeping. So it's not like animal behavior. You are Word a lot of the time as far as just like you're watching an animal do nothing or you're watching a patch of grass or whatever but it's just the the intellectual curiosity of of figuring out how they live their lives and you just get to see really cool stuff and go to cool places at least I did so those are the things that got me excited about this and um, sort of kept me going on this career path. So for the four of you, and we can all just shout this as a collective, is animal behavior not just the best topic? Like, I mean, genetics is fine, all this other stuff, but like, seriously, like us, we all like could sit for like three hours and watch one animal do one thing, a raccoon like cleaning his paws, like how cool is that? What's he doing? Why is he doing that? We don't know. And it's just, 
I, again, animals are the coolest, and I think our audience today really embodies that. You guys are, are so excited about this, uh, maybe half as excited as we are, maybe doubly excited as we are. But I love the enthusiasm for wildlife, and I really do encourage all of you guys, when you're finished these broadcasts, stay for the other five, but then go outside and go explore and become as passionate as Mona and Patrice in Asia. I mean, this is it, it's a special opportunity to interact with nature. And in fact, we've got Chris joining us for the first time. Welcome into New Hampshire. So nice to have you guys here in our chat. We've got this love fest going on between a person named Figgy and Katie, and I'm going to find out who Figgy is probably sometime in the broadcast, but that's pretty exciting. Um, great questions for everyone. We've got trolling going on. So we talked about ticks and leeches earlier. She's been, she's studied by, and then a man wants to say, you've been studied by ticks and leeches. I mean, you guys are silly. And that's the essence of Mark Melandis as well. It's fun. It's all about the learning. If you learn that as a success of this, but have a good time with it. I mean, uh, where else can you uh, compete on all of sea snake with a hagfish? And by the way, I know we've got a lot of mammal people here today. Everyone should look up hagfish because they're like giant snot worm snakes at the bottom of the ocean. The sharks try and attack and they gum up their mouths. And like, yes. what is that? Why so I, I, one of the classes I teach is basically just principles in animal biology. And all I do is talk about all animals ever. Look up videos about hagfish. Our Navy, the United States Navy, has actually been studying for years how to make the compound that hagfish make to see how we might be able to use it in other capacities. Because it's ridiculous. They make copious amounts of it. It's specifically for an anti-predator defense that because they're basically shaped like an eel with like a tiny little head. They eat dead things. They don't have jaws. What? Like, it's, they're ridiculous. They are totally ridiculous. It's not worm snakes. Exactly. It's not worm snakes. Um, yeah. this, uh, I should never have brought up hagfish. That's my fault. It's my bad. Because now yeah. we've got a rabbit hole. <laughs> Asia, what were you going to say? I was uh, just, I didn't realize hagfish were in this. I, I've just, I just looked at the bracket. Oh my God. Uh, There's no way sea snakes can win against them. No. Sea snakes are done. Up. Now, I must say, truly, so my mother, like, who's not afraid of any animal, the one thing that I don't like in the world is centipedes, I must admit. Like, the idea of, like, one of those cave centipedes that's, like, 17 inches long and goes to the roof of the cave and, like, hunts bats. That's just wrong. Like, it's just pure wrong. But, like, sea snakes are my mom's thing. So, like, you're in the water, and then there's this snake in it. And we love snakes. We, like, run, like, we, we pick up snakes nicely. I mean, observe snakes nicely without picking them up, of course, for the purposes of this conversation. Um, but my mother, like, like a snake in the water is just an un... It's an unholy uh, type of movement, I think. Um, by the way, we've got, we've got high school zoology classes. By the way, I should have gone to school in Pennsylvania. If you have high school zoology classes, is the coolest thing ever. Like we were like generic biology. We had to hear about all that genetics, which is boring slash super cool because it's next. Um, ladies, this has been such a fun program today. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. Time flies when you're having fun. Is there like a, a final message? Uh, from all of you, for our, our students today of all ages tuning in, excited about Marchville and Mattis. Asia, we haven't started with you yet in this whole shebang. No, <laughs> I can, I, Asia, we're not starting with you. Um, Anne, we're starting with you. Anne, come on up. Come on up, Anne. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would just say that follow your passion, follow your curiosity. There's just so much to learn out there, and March Mammal Madness is a great way of just learning a whole bunch of stuff about a whole variety of animals and the breadth of zoology. Um, and it's find the find like the humor in it and find the angle that like really sparks your soul. Um, and just have fun with it. And hopefully it'll lead you all down all sorts of interesting paths. That is a beautiful answer. See, the problem is, is that it's hard to be first and it's hard to be last because everyone else has taken all your answers, which is what we had in the first program. So Asia, I'll, I'll still I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a minute, Asia. We'll, we'll do the thing. <laughs> Mona, come on in. We're going to come to you. <laughs> All right. Um, I think the biggest thing, along with what Anne said, like stay curious, but also like don't be afraid to ask questions. Ask all the questions you can. Think about how things interact and how things work. Um, and that'll like lead you down a lot of interesting paths, especially in the case of Mammal March Madness, as well as everywhere else in life. That is a uh, gut. This has been like the, the series of beautiful answers. Someone needs to flub at some point. Um, no pressure. Uh, Asia, come on in and we'll wrap up with Patrice in a minute. <laughs> um, so I'll say that both in life, I'm going to riff off of Anne's answer, is basically just follow your heart. Um, follow what you're passionate about. And this could work for life. And it could also work for March Marshmallow Madness. Um, you never know when an upset will occur. Okay. That's a, a, our, our plug. And we determined earlier that there's like, 
there's a science behind this bracket. It's not just Asia choosing and making those upsets happen, we promise. A very important note as we go into this tournament. By the way, uh, Patrice, before I come to you to wrap up, the YouTube chat has devolved into two two different camps, okay? We've got like teachers that like love everything that's going on and they're so excited and they like live and breathe everything that we're trying to embody in today's program and it's beautiful. And then we've also got things like this, which I yeah. know let's speak for itself. And then I'm gonna take off the screen. Um, Patrice, what is our, our final takeaway before we wrap up today? Yeah, no, I would just say, I literally learn every year from March Mammal Madness and I'm a college professor. Like that is the, that is why I love it. I love it because it's cool things that get me excited. I love that I learn new things. I love that I get to meet new people virtually. Um, and, you know, maybe one day get to meet all these amazing ladies in person who are on this call. Um, so uh, to, to kind of, and that applies not only to March Mammal Madness, but I think in life, like you're never going to know everything and that's okay. But it's super cool when you get to have that oh my gosh, moment of you find out something new. Exactly. If you're learning, you're winning, which is the tagline for March Mammal Madness. But I feel like that very much applies um, for life as well. Whether science is your thing, whether sports are your thing, whether music is your thing, it doesn't matter. You know, like as long as you're learning something, it, it it's a the process of learning is fun. And I'm so glad you mentioned in the lifelong note of it. I mean, you 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 can always learn a new thing. You can always get involved. We've got kids of all ages. We've got uh, the poor college students of Patrice that are that you know came in thinking they were just going to have to do tests, and now they're filling out brackets, and they never saw this coming. But I mean, at all ages, it's exciting to learn more about the world around you, whether that's science or art or math or whatever you're keen on. Today, of course, and throughout the cool course of March, we are talking about amazing wildlife, amazing creatures. I really do hope everyone gets the chance to head to the Lib Guide, which I haven't brought up yet. I'm going to put that in the chat for everybody too, because that is part of my job today. Um, so if you guys want to check out this bracket, if you want to get involved and learn more, that lib guide is your go-to way of doing that. It's a fantastic resource and you can check it all out on Twitter as well at 2022 MMM Let's Go, which embodies all this crazy stuff that's going on on YouTube right now. Uh, for what it's worth, one last final plug from me, not at all professional, but Team Senti and Pinecone, okay? They're the best. Penguins beat Bison. I don't care how high they jump. I don't care how big the orc is. I don't care how loud the injury yells, okay? Baboons, they can do whatever their business all over the place with their microbiome, and the pangolin is going to take it this year. I am convinced. Thank you all so, so much for providing a very enthusiastic uh, second broadcast of our day. We'll end the broadcast there for all our YouTube viewers. Check us out in like 13 minutes as we start number three. Keep the energy going. Wear your yellow shirts. Get super excited. Asia, Mona, and Patrice, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, ladies. Bye for now. Same to you. Bye. Thank you.